today, you see my topic is about accessibility. But before I start, I want to ask you, who knows about web accessibility or know how it works, how to implement it on the web? Please raise your hand. Well, fair enough, really, fair enough. <laughs> so we will start from the beginning. What is actually accessibility? And according to the Oxford Dictionary, accessibility is something that you can reach, understand, and get to something, right? And in our real life, we often apply accessibility to things like wheelchair ramps in the buses, wheelchair ramps to the buildings, to the shops. And here's the question, why not do the same for the websites, right? Why not to make websites accessible too? And what is actually web accessibility? The original definition states, says that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web. But I slightly changed the definition that everyone, actually, everyone can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web. And web accessibility has four core principles, perceivable, Information displayed on the website should be per perceivable no matter who are your users. So for example, if you have like hard of hearing or you are deaf and the website has some video content, you should still be able to perceive the information using captions. A parable. So there are users that don't use mouse or just can't use mouse. And these users still should be able to perform the same actions like using the mouse, just using with keyboard. Understandable. The content and actions are understandable for everyone, and all actions are performed in a predictable way. So what does it mean? If you have on your website, like, button, buy product, if the user clicks on it, he should be immediately navigate to the page where he can pay for the product, and nothing in between, like something confusing with different information and robust. So we know that devices, user engines, they evolve, like they're changing, but your content should still remain accessible. So why is actually it's important, right? And usually when we start to create and build products, we ask ourselves, who are our users? And usually we make a wrong assumption that all our users are fully able, which is not true. For example, you are building a photo app. You might think, well, why would the blind user want to use my app? Actually, everyone has the same goals. Even the blind user wants to take a photo, share with friends, share it on social networks, right? So this is like for everyone. Like everyone has same goals, as I said, like sending email, shopping on Amazon, buying tickets. Everything has the same. And I really love this quote from the Tim Berners-Lee, which is actually the inventor of World Wide Web. He said that the power of the web is in its universality and access by everyone regardless of disability is an essential aspect. And I really support this quote. So, you know, the accessibility benefits for everyone, including you. Everyone in this room will get an age, right? Some of you will get low vision, I'm already wearing glasses, <laughs> and hard of hearing. And some of you, at this, like all of you at some point of your life, will need to use the websites and will need them to be accessible. So it benefits for everyone. And regarding the statistic, around 20% of people worldwide have some type of disability. And it's one billion people. And it's actually every sixth person. Quite a big number, right? And to give you more statistics, um, according to the American Institute of Research, they recently reported that working age people in the United States, they're bringing alone income $21 billion. And you might think about their friends and family who are using some application to interact with the people. So, regarding to the Gartner research, people with disabilities, their friends and family worldwide, 
they are bringing along disposable income eight trillion dollars. Think about it. And I'll give you one more statistic. So 71 p users with disabilities, they click away from the website with, which has some access bar barriers. So in the same time, they are passing that, that income to other website which is like more accessible and it's around $12 billion. So what we actually create is useless if it's not accessible. And to know like how to ma implement accessibility to your websites, you also it's very important to know what kind of disabilities could your users have. And there are like four main types of disabilities. The first one is visual. The people from range from low vision to the totally blindness. Auditory from the hard of hearing to the total deaf. Motor and mobility impairments, it's like even if you have wrist that injured your wrist or broken arm or you have like paralyzed body. Cognitive intellectual, it's like memory effectness, logic, logic uh, disabilities, so everything which is related to the brain actually. So I want you to consider these three people on, the, on this image. So this is the boy in a wheelchair, the girl with a broken arm, and the woman with a big bag of groceries. So I might ask you, whom do you think of these three people has like some kind of motor disability? And actually the answer is, all of them. All of them have some kind of relation to the motor disability, whether it's permanent or temporary or situational. So have you had the situation when you had like holding big bag of some groceries or anything else and you were trying to use your phone with one hand and it was a bit uncomfortable, right? And people with disabilities, they use the software and hardware to improve interaction with the web. And this is what is called assistive technologies. And this, is in, this includes like braille terminals for the blind people, screen magnifiers for people with low vision, eye tracking devices, specific, specific touch devices. And of course, everyone know about the Stephen Hawking who had used a really wide range of assistive technologies. And also very popular, the screen readers. So what does the screen readers do? It's the programs which speaks aloud everything displayed on your screen. And the most popular of them is Joe's NVDA narrator for Windows, Orca for Linux, VoiceOver for Mac OS, and Chromevox for Chrome, which actually works for any OS. And you know, the accessibility topic is very broad. And it's very easy to get lost when it's going to be like, to think about how to implement it. So that's why on this journey, we need to follow some guidelines, so some rules. And the World Wide Web Consortium, which is more or less the government body of the web, they created the Web Accessibility Initiative. And they created the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And the last version 2.1, one was actually published this June. And it's the most popular and used guideline on how to implement accessibility. I really advise to take a look at it. I, I know it can be a lot of text and it's quite easy to get lost in it, but just step by step, because there is a lot of useful, useful information there. So how actually assistive technology works with websites, right? So here on the screen, you can see that we have application our websites, and you know, like websites are parsed to the DOM tree, and at the same time, they are passed, parsed to the accessibility tree. So assistive technology, for example, screen reader, they consume this accessibility tree and translate it to the meaningful way to the user. For example, if you have on your page, you use HTML, elements like UL and LIs, like to have the list. So the screen reader will know that this is a list and it will tell the user, hey, this is a list of items, right? 
but sometimes we need to build some custom like elements, for example, menu. And you still can use the UL element for the whole menu and allies and style it to look like a menu. But for screen reader, it still will be the list. So would it be cool if we could use like role menu and role menu item to describe this, that this is actually in the menu. And this is actually exist. This is called area attributes. And this by area is a specification of additional set of HTML attributes which can be applied to elements and provide additional semantics so improve accessibility whenever it is lacking. And area stands for accessible rich internet applications. And they also have the very rich guideline with different use cases and describing different attributes on how and when and how to apply them. So this is works kind of like that. So you have the same DOM and adding this area attributes, it kind of improve your accessibility tree to make it more semantically correct. As I said, area is a way to add missing semantics. And there are like three types of these attributes. The one is roles, which indicates the type. So we had an example with the menu. The second one is states. So you ha can have like collapse, expanded, and you can describe it using this area attributes. And one more is properties, which describe some characteristics of the element. And there is like a bunch of them. But don't get stressed out, because I know this a lot. We will go like baby steps. So this is like I will follow with few rules that are like must have when we are talking about accessibility. The first one, declare the language. So declaring the language using lang attribute is not only good for your search engine optimization, and not only good for translation tools, it's also very important for assistive technologies. So you see, I have the line paragrapher with setting French language. So when screen reader will read this line, it will automatically switch from English, for example, to French, and will read the sentence with correct pronunciation. Second one. Use semantic HTML. We can kind of split all elements, HTML elements, to semantic and non-semantic. So what do I mean by that? So for example, button. Everyone knows what it is button. You don't need to explain for someone what is button. You know like what to expect from it. But often we can use div for button, like it's very common technique. And it's kind of back practice. As regarding actually assistive technologies too. So I have here looking the same two buttons. And for the first one, if I'll go with screen reader to this button on the left, it will read search. What the hell is search? Is it text? Is it button? Is it input? You don't know. And this is because I use just deal which I styled properly, and I know like a lot of you have used like instead of buttons divs. So for the second case, it will read correct search button because I used here a proper button element, and this is not the only advantage out of that. I have an example here in a code, so I will try to turn on the screen reader. It can be loud, but I just hope you'll get the idea how it works. Primary. Search oh. button. Oh. Search button. Search. Search button. Search. Search button. So you see, uh, like you are currently it, on a button inside yeah, a frame zero. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw, like, on the right button, it read correctly, on the left, it's just search. And the other thing is, let me uncomment few lines of code. So I added living, even listener on click for both of the buttons. So when I click on them, I'll get the alert. Okay. So 
what actually expected from the button for users who are using keyboard? We expect that when we press enter and space, we will have the same click action, right? So for the native button, it, it is out of the box. It's already, you press enter space and it triggers the click action. Well, it wouldn't work for the deal. It do not, does nothing. So you have to add additional even listeners on key down and to check if it's enter space, like trigger click. One more thing that I want to show you. So for example, I want to disable button. So I added the disabled attribute. I just style it to be gray. And for a native, like semantic, color correct button, it's, it skips all actions. It skips, like you can't click it. It's disabled, it means it's disabled. But for a deal, you still can click on it and it still, it works. So you have to write one more additional thing to write if it's disabled, like skip all actions. So, Prefer to use semantic elements than non-semantic. And also regarding semantics, one more thing, it is uh, navigational landmarks. And they are currently like describing the organization and structure of your website. So blind users who are using screen readers they often report that when they land on the unfamiliar page for the first time, it's very useful for them to know what is the structure of the page, how it looks like, and like to jump to the appropriate content. So when they use screen reader, they can like launch this pop-up, and it has a list of all landmarks like main, banner, navigation, so they can really quickly jump to the needed section. And all, all you can do is like adding this navigation landmarks tags. So we know this header, like footer, you can put in the footer some organizational information, nav tag, which contains all the links where a user can navigate through your website the main content and the site, which is like not main, but really related to your website, like some banners. The third step, tab key navigation and tab order. So what is actually tab order? This is the order when, in which DOM elements receive focus when user press tab. And I think you're experiencing it like when you are trying to tab like you have inputs, like form, and you try to tap through form, and you see that focus is going like through different elements. And this is called tab order. And actually focus, the elements which can receive focus natively is like inputs, buttons, links, and some of them, like none, can't have this focus. So for example, you're building a drop down and you're using div because you like can't really build drop down from all native elements. And it is not focused by default. So if the user uses a keyboard, he should like still get the focus of this element and interact with it. So to make the element focusable, all you need to do is add tab index equals zero. So it will add your element into the natural tab order of the DOM, and also it receives this focusable behavior. So even if you call on this element in JavaScript.focus, this element will receive focus. And here are some bad practices which better not apply when you're building your websites and to not break your focus. So here I have to, I let me zoom a bit. So here I have three paragraphers. I put their tab index equals zero, but you will never need it in real life. It's just for the demo. So now you see I click tab and it receives focus. I click tab again, it receives focus and it goes to the last. So it goes from left to right, from up to down. So 
what we like to do with CSS, you know, we like to play with CSS, and we want to move some element to the end. So what we do, we usually like to apply float right. And you can see that my first paragraph became the last only visually because the DOM still stays the same. So the tab order still the same. In that case, if I press tab, the focus goes like to the last element, then to that one, and then to the next one. So it kind of has broken tab order already. So if you want to move some element to the end, move it physically in the DOM, like do not change positions of the elements with uh, CSS. Use CSS only for styling. And one more thing I want to show you. So I have here like my pretty button. <laughs> when I click on it, it gets also focus. It gets this fo blue focus ring. But often, like usually like designers, can request, well, this like blue outline doesn't match our design, remove it. So what we usually do is we put, the, we put outline none to our button. So it will never get the focus. So if the user use, use the keyboard, he will never get to this button and can interact with that, right? So try to avoid such techniques. If you want to style it and match your design, you can style outline, like I did. Isn't beautiful? <laughs> well, it was just for example, but you always can make it beautiful, right? But don't like skip it because it's just not matching your design, because you're like broken, broken experience for someone. So the first step, using area attributes. I've covered on the second step to prefer to stick with semantic HTML, but sometimes you kind of can't because you need to build some, as I showed, menus to, to build some custom elements. And for example, I also have these two look in the same buttons. And all you know, this is like delete button because it has delete icon. If you click on it, it will probably delete something, right? But for the blind user, he'll never know it because he doesn't see it. And if I read the screen reader, this first button, it will read button. OK, let me click it. Oops, I deleted something, right? <laughs> so how actually the code looks like, if you can see it, on, I don't know if you can see on the back rows. So I used only button element. And because it doesn't have the text in between, I added the icon just using CSS, it will like kind of empty button, right? So for such cases, how you can fix it, it is using area attributes. And for that case, I used area label equal delete. So screen readers, they will read everything that you will describe there. You can even write a long, long sentence, it will read it. And in that case, we can still give the correct meaning for the users, so it will get the delete button. Fives, fives, fives. <laughs> Color control focus with keyboard. Imagine you have a list on your page. It kind of can be selectable list. And it's a long list. And it's a very, very long list. And if you want to make it focusable, user will need to tap and shift tab through all the list. And if he wants to go back, he will shift up all the way through. A bit of boring and a bit not really good user experience, right? So for those cases, try to use JavaScript. So you can handle focus of the list items using right arrow up and arrow down. And for the more like bigger section, you can still remain with tabbing, so the user will tab through bigger sections, and when he is on list, he can, for example, click enter and navigate with up arrow and down arrow. So actually, this is expected behavior for users who are using the keyboard. And the six, 
like the last but not least, keep color contrast. So regarding the guidelines, the small text should stick with the color contrast ratio 4 to 5 to 1 for small text and for large, large text 3 to 1. So you can ask, what the hell is these numbers? I don't, I don't understand how to apply it and how to use it. Actually, there are a lot of online checkers out there. I made this test on the webaim.org website. I probably don't see it in the, in the bottom. So it's a very useful website with different resources and best practices on accessibility. But this kind of checkers, there are a lot of them on the internet. So I tried my light gray on text on the dark gray background and it failed, but when I tried to make it lighter, it passed. So this is like all kind of things, like colors should be defined during actually design process. Like, you know, you pick the right colors for your website and you should like select like correctly contrast colors between them. Isn't it beautiful? Uh, <laughs> So, also keep in mind about color blindness. So there are people like re red, green, color blind, blindness, and they would actually see this half of the screen as gray, just gray. They don't see the difference between the green and the red, so keep in top of mind. And this is kind of example of the colors I actually used for this presentation. So what I said, when it's the design process, you just pick the right set of colors which has the correct contrast between them. It's like background, foreground, and accent colors. So of course, if you're implementing accessibility, you have to test it properly. So there are a bunch of useful tools like X, Wave, and Lighthouse, and they're all the browser extension, which is easy to install and use, and Lighthouse, maybe some of you who already use it, is built in in DevTools in Chrome in our desktop. And also, if you want to automate your testing, so you want to be sure that every feature you deliver will not broke your accessibility, you can add, you can use the AxCore library, which is open source, and add it to the for example, CI builds. And of course, some manual work. So, throw away your mouse, like for a minute, for example, and try to use your website with keyboard. How far you can get? Do you still can perform the same actions you can perform with mouse? And download the screen reader. Also try to use only keyboard. Put on your eyes the sleeping mask. Go to Google search. How far you can get? In another thing, there is a very useful extension of coffee where you can actually test this di different visual effects like blurry, even like color blindness. So this is like a bunch of useful tools which can pretend like you are like disabled. And I know that this is like overwhelmed information, like a lot for you, if you're first time familiar with accessibility. But what I can tell that as far as you go in implementing accessibility, it can be even harder. But don't get struggled if you can't make some element or some component accessible. Try to think about alternative way, how you can deliver the same information to the user but in different way. Try to search about alternatives. And always remember the small changes making a big difference. Whether you changed all your divs to the buttons or you added additional like area attributes to bring more semantic to your website, it's already a big change for someone. And this is like a big list of resources I would like to share with you. The first one is a very useful Udacity course. It's actually free. And there are like guidelines and different other resources you can 
goes through. And I want to finish my session with the best tip for you. So start all your new projects and website with accessibility in mind because design is always cheaper than redesign and actually is more effective. So now it's your turn. I wanted you to be aware about the accessibility so you can start and make the small changes and every like small step is already a big difference and to the to the someone and you, it's a bigger, bigger step to make your websites user friendly for all your users. And just set the industry and keep accessibility top of mind whenever you are starting new product, project or product or making some redesign or design. So now it's your turn. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm a member of a project named Self-Cut. It's three-dimensional editor, three-dimensional graphics editor. And I have a generic question. Uh, what uh, we uh, can do, uh, how we can deal with users with visual disability who surely unable to use our application at all, how we can deal with them, how we can uh, explain well them uh, that they really unable to use our application, not because we made something bad, but because they really unable to. So, the like blind users, they actually the one who are using screen readers. They are actually very professional in using screen readers. And they can really quickly know if it's a website accessible or no. So there are like this guideline and all these shortcuts and keyboards. So they already know how it goes, how it works. And if your website doesn't follow these rules, they will just click away from this website. So we don't need to tell them. But actually, there is also you, what you can add to your website. It's kind of called help content, like accessibility guideline for your website. If you have some different like techniques you used or something, so you can, can explain to them how actually they can use your website. Yeah, thank you so much to Sophia once again. Thanks so thank much you. for this interesting topic.